Hi everyone, I'm Melissa with Midnight Hour Oil. I know I haven't been out here for a little while. Uh, things have been relatively quiet. With the exception of the community post I put out a week or so ago, uh, where I was talking about a dream I was given. And I was given this dream after I had gone over to a friend's house and learned some things about what was going on in the local grade school. And just, she was explaining how the police are there every day. I mean, we're talking five and six years old, these kids bringing guns and knives to school. After that visit and learning just how, how crazy and chaotic things are, even among our youngest members of society, uh, I had this dream. And in this dream, I saw these parents and they had maybe a three or four year old little boy and he would not listen to them. He was sitting there and they were trying to do everything they could to get him to listen. And so I leaned in real close and I heard him saying things like he wanted to murder. He wanted somebody to murder his parents. He kept using the word murder. And I knew he had a spirit of murder. And the parents though would not accept this. They just kept trying to get him to listen to them. And I knew it was futile because I understood this little child had a spirit, a demonic spirit. And in the community post I shared, I explained how there's several inlets for the enemy uh, for children today, uh, Pokemon cards, many movies, uh, many different types of entertainment, phone entertainment that they're being exposed to and it's opening doors to the enemy. And this is very concerning. And so I, I want to share some things with you that the Holy Spirit has been opening my eyes to as I have been reading a book by Kenneth Hagin. Uh, it's called The Triumphant Church, right? The Triumphant Church by Kenneth Hagin. And I'm going to leave a link in the description box to Amazon if you would want to purchase a copy of this. And I highly recommend that you do. Because what I learned in this book were many tactics and many things concerning spiritual warfare. Uh, things that Kenneth Hagin was taught during a visitation with Jesus in 1952. He was brought into a vision, and for an hour and a half, Jesus revealed many truths concerning spiritual warfare found in the Word of God. Now, I want to tell you ahead of time, Kenneth, he would not accept something in a vision, even from Jesus himself, unless he could show him in the Word of God where what Jesus was saying was true according to the word of God, which is really important for all of us to do, no matter what you have a dream, a vision, a word, a visitation, whatever, it has to line up with the word of God. Now, if people had been doing that throughout the ages, we wouldn't have a lot of the uh, way off the mark teachings and even religions that we have today. They receive something spiritual, so they assume it's from God. And that's not always the case. So when I share what I'm sharing with you, you have to understand Kenneth demanded uh, scriptures when he was being told and taught these things by Jesus in this visitation. And Jesus provided him with scriptures. So I, I don't know exactly how long this video is going to take because there's several things I want to share. So please bear with me. These are very important things and I want you to hear uh, what the Holy Spirit has revealed and shared uh, with Kenneth and to me and now to you. And so anyway, I want to start off with the four demon classes. So in, in, the, in the book, I'm going to read a few excerpts from it. Jesus explains to Kenneth that there are four classes of demons, which we learn about in Ephesians 6, verse 12. Okay, this is what the Apostle Paul taught. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So right here, Paul lists four different types, four classes of demonic spirits. Now, Kenneth goes on to say, below they are listed in their order or rank from the greatest to the least in power with some explanation about their rank. Wicked spirits or spiritual wickedness in high places. The highest class exists in the heavenlies, not on the earth. All right. Now that class was the class that uh, John Paul Jackson had talked about that we cannot be trying to pull down. The second class is rulers of the darkness of this world. The highest class of demons believers have to deal with on the earth. 
Number three, powers, the next class of, or category. They are dominated by and receive their instructions from the rulers of the darkness of this world. And then number four, principalities, the lowest class. They are ruled over and dominated by the other classes and do very little thinking on their own. All right, so I've, that's very interesting because I thought the principalities were the highest, but they're not. They're actually the lowest class. Jesus explained to Kenneth on page 16 of the book how our authority is intended to work over these demons. All right, so Jesus explained that the rulers of darkness also try to rule over believers who are not walking in the light of their redemption or who do not know or do not exercise their rights and privileges in Christ, which is a lot of people. Uh, Jesus told me that according to his word, believers are to take authority over these first three classes of demons, principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world. He said that if we on earth will bind the operation of the first three classes of demons, according to his word, he will deal with the fourth class of demons, spiritual wickedness in high places. Again, that's the group that we as believers haven't been given authority over that are in that second heaven. We are uh, to deal with the other three classes. And then uh, Jesus gave Kenneth Matthew 18, 18 to substantiate this. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So in other words, if we take care of taking authority over those other lower classes of demons, then Jesus deals with the higher classes. We do not have to think about taking care of that group. Jesus deals with them in his power. On page 96, Kenneth made this statement. He said, we do not lose our free will when we're born again. And this is substantiated by John 15, 6, which says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. To not remain in indicates that the person was in Christ at one time. I did a video sharing the truth of those scriptures in John chapter 15. Um, a while back, but Kenneth goes into great detail about a woman who in the 1952 vision visitation he was given with the Lord, the Lord used this woman as an example to show him the truth concerning that statement. I'll be honest, when I read this, it was very disturbing to me. Uh, I, I know from the scriptures that a person can choose to walk away from the Lord. I just couldn't really identify or relate to it. And when I read this account of this woman, it really brought it home. And it, it's, it was, it just grieved my spirit. It grieved my spirit tremendously. And so what happened? Okay. Kenneth was praying with another pastor. And when the, when he was given the vision, now this other pastor had been married previously to a woman and Kenneth didn't really know anything about her but in the vision when he went into the vision Jesus showed Kenneth this woman and how she how she was led astray by demonic influences she was resisting the the voice of a demon that was telling her you because she had a very beautiful singing voice uh you could be you're beautiful you could have fame and you could have fortune in the world. Now at first she was resisting those thoughts, but then eventually she started to cling to them and believe them. And this goes, this drives home the, the importance of taking our thoughts captive and making them obedient to the Lord Jesus and being grounded in the word, which the beginning, the first three or four chapters, Kenneth drives this point home. But to not be grounded in the truth and to be listening to the lies of the enemy is, is so dangerous uh, that this story will show you how dangerous it really is. So as she began to believe these lies and, and began to embrace them, she ended up leaving her husband and going into the world and finding and started living with other men. And uh, so then Kenneth sees in a vision this woman going she's in a hotel room with a man and he sees another man who he knows is a pastor going to her to the room knocking on the door she comes half dressed 
and he says to her, he's trying to get her to come back to the Lord. And she basically makes the statement to H with Jesus, right? She basically said, you know, she didn't want anything to do with him. So Kenneth goes on to ask the Lord, do you want me to pray for her? And the Lord tells him, no, do not pray for her. And that really upset Kenneth because he said he didn't believe that was scriptural. And so Jesus explains to him, he answered, didn't you ever read in my word? If any man see his brother in sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them, that sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. 1 John 5, 16. Jesus said, there is a sin unto death, and the word says not to pray for those who committed it. So 1 John 5, 16 is the scripture that tells you that if somebody has committed the sin unto death, that there's no point in praying for them. Don't pray for them. So what he began to explain to Kenneth is this woman didn't want Jesus anymore. She did not want him, and therefore she had committed the unpardonable sin. And so Jesus goes into great depth explaining Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. It lists five things a person would have to do in order to forfeit their salvation. So I'm sharing this with you not to cause fear, but really to alleviate the fear of many who believe they may have committed that sin, because very few actually have committed the sin unto death. But I want to go over this scripture and, and what Jesus specifically told Kenneth so that you can understand and maybe help others who are fearful that they may have committed this sin. So Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 tells us, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the word, the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an, to open shame, to an open shame. All right, this right, I'm just going to read this excerpt of what Jesus said to Kenneth. Jesus explained to me that before a Christian could be guilty of committing the sin unto death, all five condition, me, conditions mentioned in this scripture would have to apply to the person. First, it says, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened. Hebrews 6, 4, Jesus said, this referred to what many of us in those days called getting under conviction. The preaching of the word enlightens the sinner. It's like the prodigal son when he came to himself, Luke 15, 17. Through the preaching of God's word, the sinner sees that he, that he is lost. He's enlightened about the truth of God's word, and he sees his need for a savior. Second, Hebrews 6, 4 says, and have tasted of the heavenly gift. Jesus said, a man under conviction has not yet tasted of the heavenly gift because Jesus is the heavenly gift. Jesus quoted John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So tasting of the heavenly gift refers to salvation, receiving Jesus Christ as savior. Then third, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 6, 4, Jesus told me that means more than being born again and becoming acquainted with the Holy Spirit through his indwelling presence. <clears throat> it refers to being filled with the Holy Spirit, having received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, then forth and have tasted the good word of God. Jesus said this can't apply to baby Christians. They haven't tasted the good word of God. Baby Christians are still on the sincere milk of the word. 1 Peter 2, 2 tell us, tells us, and as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. All right. Only those who have had some degree of spiritual growth and who fully understand the seriousness of denying Christ and are experienced in the solid meat of the word could be guilty of committing this sin. Now understand this woman that he was seeing, that pastor's ex-wife, she... Um, was in ministry for 20 years with him. So she was a mature believer in Christ before she walked away. Uh, so Kenneth goes on to say, Jesus pointed out the similarity between spiritual and physical growth. He said, baby Christians can't be guilty of committing the unpardonable sin because they wouldn't be mature enough to know what they are doing. The fifth condition for committing the unpardonable sin is that a person has tasted the powers of the world to come. 
Hebrews 6, 5. Jesus explained to me what this meant. He said that the power of the world to come are spiritual gifts. He, Jesus explained, those who have tasted the powers of the world to come are mature Christians who have the gifts of the Spirit operating in their lives or ministries. He explained that the baptism of the Holy Spirit will be with the ensuing gifts is the earnest of our inheritance in the world to come. So there are five Bible qualifications a believer would have to meet before he or she could be guilty of committing the unpardonable sin. You can readily see that very few believers could qualify to be guilty of committing the sin. All right, so the unpardonable sin is rejecting Jesus, walking away from him. That is, as John Fenn always says, the only sin Jesus didn't die on the cross to cover was the sin of rejecting him and his blood. Kenneth shares a story of a woman who she had been, she was a Christian, she was a born again believer, and she had given way to fear and she allowed the enemy to come in and, and basically captivate her mind with fear, thoughts of fear. And so she ended up, instead of take, you know, fighting and taking the word of God and, and applying it to what the enemy was saying, taking every thought captive and making it obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, she ended up uh, being institutionalized. And so her sister brought this woman after, they were basically ready to just let her go home and die. The sister brought her to Kenneth and uh, this woman was prayed for. She did have that demonic attachment on her. And Kenneth goes into great detail about the difference between being possessed, obsessed, uh, or oppressed. And so a person who has the spirit of God in their spirit cannot be fully possessed by the enemy because their spirit is recreated. It is, uh, it belongs to the Lord, but they can be influenced in their soul, which is the mind, will, and emotions, and the enemy can attach to those things. And that's what happened with this woman. Anyway, she got delivered from it, but Kenneth asked the question to the sister, how many people, because this woman, as it turned out, believed she had committed the unpardonable sin. And he asked how many people in the institution she was in were in there for that reason. And the statistic was given 90%. So people who are entertaining the lies of the enemy are really giving him an opportunity to take their mind, take control of their minds and, and cause them to go over the edge of insanity. So it's important for us, church, I can't emphasize enough, to take every thought captive and line it up with the Word of God and ensure that it is the truth. Uh, because the enemy will use it to destroy your life, if he can, and in that one woman's life, ultimately, to even cause you to reject Jesus, to walk away from him, believing that there's something better in this world uh, for you, and that God lied to you somehow, and so... We have to be careful, church, what we are thinking and what we are believing. So anyway, a couple other things. I know this video is getting kind of long, so I don't want to go on too much longer. But when Kenneth was told to pray over somebody who was in a different geographical location, he was concerned because he said, well, that person's in another state or something. And Jesus told him this. He said, uh, there is no distance in the spirit realm. There's no distance in the spirit realm. So if you have a relative or friend and they're in another state, uh, you have a, you can take authority over any spirit that's harassing them. Uh, but you have to understand we can, we have no authority over another person's will or spirit. We cannot, Jesus himself will not violate a person's free will. Satan cannot violate a person's free will. So if a person is in a place where they want to hold on to that demonic spirit, like that woman who left her, her husband, who was a preacher, and went into the world, you can't cast that demon out of them because they want it. But you can take authority over the spirit itself. And you can command it to not rise up against you. You can command it uh, to not come into your home. So the last thing was, and this is really, and this is a really profound truth that a lot of us may not realize. Jesus literally said to Kenneth, Jesus said to me to pray that I, the Lord Jesus Christ, or that God, the father would do anything about the devil is to waste your time. I said, dear Lord, I've wasted a lot of time. A lot of folks today are wasting their time. 
Then Jesus said, God the Father and I have done all that we are ever going to do about the devil until the time when the angel of God will come down from heaven and bind the devil with a chain and put him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Revelation 21 through 3. Uh, Jesus said, in every epistle that's written to the church, to believers, if the writer of the epistle said anything about the devil, he always told believers that they were to do something about the devil. I'm, and then he said, I'm going to give you four references to prove that believers themselves have authority over the devil. And I don't have time to read all these. The, this is getting really long, but I'll give you the references. It's Matthew 28, 18. Then Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Mark 16, 15, and 17, and James 4, 7. So Jesus basically is explaining to, to Kenneth that he delegated his authority to us, the church. And it is our responsibility to take authority over the adversary, over any work of the enemy that's coming against us, and command it to cease and desist, cast it out. And of course, it goes without saying that we take authority over the demon in Jesus' name. It is by his authority, not our own, that we cast them out, that we command them to cease and desist their maneuvers against us. And, uh, and then the power of God backs us up. The power of God will back us up. But we have to be the ones, church, to take that authority and do our due diligence uh, to come against the adversary, to stand our ground. But the most important thing, again, is getting rooted in the truth of the Word of God, knowing the truth, and making sure that anything we're thinking is aligned with the truth. As always, take this message to God. Ask Him for confirmation. Don't just take my word for things, Kenneth's word. Take these things to God and ask him for confirmation. I'm going to put a link in the description box to Amazon. Uh, you can purchase one of these for about $15. And there's other places you can pick these books up. But uh, that's just where I typically buy books. So anyway, I hope, I pray this message has encouraged you. Please share it with anybody who you know can receive this message of truth. And, uh, and needs help in the spiritual warfare realm because we all are in a battle. We all are in a war, but we are not all walking in our authority in Christ the way we need to. As always, church, it is my prayer that we will all continue to keep our lamps burning bright while we wait for Jesus. I love you all. God bless you.